Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. I am going to start by reading um, a short, it's actually the first two pages of the book just to set up the story. And it's from the book, The Black Angels, the untold story of the nurses who helped cure tuberculosis. And this is from chapter one. It's called The Call for Nurses. No one knew exactly how it started or who set it in motion. But in the spring of 1929, suddenly, inexorably, the white nurses at Seaview Hospital began quitting. One by one, they hung up their uniforms and walked out. Their reasons varied. Many of them were weary of the long commute from Manhattan to Staten Island and the successive days of 12 to 14 hour shifts. Some cited the chronic mental and physical toll their job demanded. But most were leaving to escape tuberculosis, the great white plague, the robber of youth, the quote, captain of the men of death, and its victims, the quote, infected incurable indigent consumptives. That's who came to Seaview, New York's largest municipal sanatorium. On its floors, hundreds of patients lay in iron frame beds languishing, their bodies swarming with millions of arrogant microbes that gnawed at their lungs, kidneys, and tongues, their spines, bones, and brains. All day long, they sweated and groaned and cried out, they coughed and choked and spit up blood, each hack sending swarms of live germs onto bedpans and sheets, tables, chairs, and doorknobs. The bacteria landed on walls and nightstands and window shades. It drifted under beds and down hallways, slinking into every room and corner of the ward. It was always present, swirling, lurking, waiting to strike anyone who wasn't already sick and all it took was a single inhalation. Over the years, the nurses had watched their colleagues fall ill. They saw how their faces turned ashen, how their eyes burned from a fever that climbed and climbed, and how their skin exuded a sickly odor that no amount of washing could eradicate. Some recovered, at least temporarily. Others died in the wards where they once worked, mouthing God in heaven or no, 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 or nothing at all. These days, as the city thrummed and churned and grew, working white women had plenty of options for jobs that wouldn't kill them. Sales clerks, cashiers, stenographers, secretaries, librarians, and telephone operators who worked the switchboard at the New York Telephone Company's new headquarters, a soaring Art Deco skyscraper, the exact opposite of the dark and sprawling sea view. As the weeks passed, the exodus at Seaview became impossible to ignore, and soon word reached the new commissioner of health, Dr. Shirley Wynne. A dapper gentleman who was dedicated to his job, Wynne had reorganized the city's infectious disease hospitals and was currently focused on a massive public health campaign aimed at eliminating a different disease, diphtheria, a bacterial infection responsible for killing thousands of New York's children each year. Months before, doctors had unveiled a vaccine, but previous mishaps with anti-diphtheric drugs had left parents hesitate to, hesitant to vaccinate their children. Frustrated, Wynne began marketing it in, quote, the same manner as chewing gum, a second family car, or cigarettes. Leaflets announcing its safety were slipped in with phone bills. Billboards and illustrated posters went up in Times Square, and health mobiles, Renovated snow removal trucks retrofitted with refrigerators to store the vaccine fanned out into neighborhoods. Inside, a nurse, fluent in each area's predominant language, encouraged, encouraged parents to vaccinate their children. But the staffing shortage at Seaview presented Wynn with a different crisis. One health mobiles and vaccines couldn't fix. Tuberculosis had no cure. Hi, this is Dave Ashkin. I uh, want to welcome you all this afternoon to uh, World TV Book Club. And uh, I have to say uh, thank you, Maria. And uh, I, uh, I am pretty blown away today. And I'm really, really honored uh, to be here. And I'm here to really try to 
support the purpose of World TV Day. As you know, World TV Day is a, a day to educate the public about the impact of TV around the world. Its purpose is to raise awareness of the challenges that, the, that hinder our progress towards the elimination of this devastating disease. Uh, each year on March 24th, this annual event commemorates the date in 1882 when Robert Koch set up his Petri dishes, set up his microscopes, and at that point started to tell us about tuberculosis. And let me read from our first uh, uh, book club back in, uh, two, in 2022. As you remember, Thomas Getz had written, and uh, it always kind of got me that it says that uh, Cox, you know, was really nervous at the time. And he was starting his uh, speech. He put his spectacles on his nose and he just said the words, the tuberculosis. And then he started to read his paper slowly with frequent pauses, not for effect, but because he was nervous. And Loeffler, who was with him, said, Koch was by no means a dynamic lecturer who would overwhelm his audience with brilliant words. He spoke slowly and haltingly. But he, what he said was clear, simple, logical, and stated. In short, pure, unadulterated gold. Koch began by putting the disease in context, reminding his audience of the vast toll that tuberculosis had taken on humanity. If the importance of disease for mankind is measured by the number of bacil uh, individual it causes, then TB must be considered much more important than those feared infectious diseases, plague, cholera, and the like. One in seven of all human beings die from tuberculosis. If one only considers the productive middle age groups, TB carries away one third and often more. And then he continued to describe how he had recognized that the way to find if TB truly was the cure, the, the, the cause of TB was to take infected animals, grow it in a, di a petri dish, and then take what grew and infected in other animals and see if they developed disease. And indeed, he did that. And he ended his, his paper by saying that all of these facts taken together can lead to only one conclusion, that the bacilli, which are present in the tuberculous uh, uh, substances, not only accompany the tuberculosis process, but are the cause of it. In the bacilli, we have, therefore, the actual infective cause of tuberculosis. And he ended with a statement. And that statement was, you know, this would be the beginning, you know, hopefully, of the cure. And the bottom line comes down to is literature really, really educates. It brings to light those individuals who have suffered, those individuals who have tried to dedicate their life to first finding the cure for themselves and finding it for others. Literature brings out the humanity. And if there's any way to raise awareness is to really appreciate what these men and women have pretty much done and dedicated. And I think it's really important that uh, this is the best way to uh, raise these awarenesses. And that's the purpose of the SNPCs uh, World TV Book Club, and it's to illustrate those stories. And I have to say to you, I and I, I it was funny. I, I get to meet Maria last week, and we were talking. But at that time, I had only read half the book, and I was pretty much hooked. And then I read the rest of the book, and now I'm blown away. I'm pretty speechless. I was like a little kid. I I wanted, you know, I, I wanted to talk to Maria more, and I get the chance to do it with you. And today, what we'd like to do is to talk about Maria's new book, The Black Angels, the untold story of the nurses who helped cure TB. And the, bottom, and the bottom line comes down to is that this is something that we all can relate to. And I think what I'm hoping at the end of this is to realize all of those individuals who stand on their shoulders today towards our fight still against tuberculosis. Many things have changed. We are so lucky with our tools, but so many things are the same. And we have to continue to fight this fight until the end. And as you know, that is the theme of World TB Day. Yes, we can end tuberculosis. And with that, 
Maria, welcome. I am hi, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Am... I'm so happy everybody keeps saying hi, hi, hi in the chat. Hello to everyone <laughs> from all different parts of the country. Thank you for joining and thank you for wanting to hear more about the book, about tuberculosis, about how literature becomes a gateway to have hard conversations, to remind us that history cannot write itself unless we look at it and face it and decide that we don't want to repeat it. So let's talk. Maria, I want to ask you a question that my parents asked me. Why tuberculosis? Like, <laughs> what have you done wrong in your life? I mean, uh, I mean, you know, uh, other people, they want to be writers and they, to pick tuberculosis, what was your inspiration? So it kind of picked me. Um, and the, the, the way it picked me was I always loved reading about infectious disease. I grew up in New York City. I loved reading how disease moved to the city. I had taken a course. I went to Hunter College. I took a class. Somebody had a class on the history of disease in New York City. And I remember reading the cholera years. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is incredible. And, and so I became fascinated with disease and, and abandoned hospitals. And as you know, New York City is rife with them. The Harbor Islands used to be where these hospitals were built. And I think there's 13 Harbor Islands. So I was... Uh, I was working as an editor for Springer. I was editing a book on rare lung disease. And I read this line, the cure for tuberculosis was found at Seaview Hospital in Staten Island. And I started Googling it and up came the story of this cure. And then next to it was this article about a cadre of black nurses called the Black Angels. And I became even more interested in that. And they talked about one woman, Miss Virginia Allen, who's still alive. Um, and I tried to track her down and I couldn't. Eventually I found her. And that's so how that's how the story began. Really, she lives in the restored nurses residence on the abandoned complex at Seaview Hospital. So when you walk out her front door, you are surrounded by those pavilions, the hollowed out remains of the children's hospital, the open air cottages, the labs. Um, and I became completely enthralled by this story, not only about the disease, but about these women who were called up to avert a public health crisis because as I read, the white nurses were quitting and the city became desperate. They had managed to lower the TB rate since Seaview was built in 1913 um, from 10,000 a year annually to 5,000. And it was basically when was like, not on my watch, is this going to happen? Um, the Seaview will be restaffed in whatever way we possibly can. And so they they looked towards what was happening with the great migration, how recruiters were going down and bringing up sharecroppers by promising them, you know, housing and good pay to work in steel mills. And they said, well, nursing isn't that kind of labor, but let's try it. And so they sent out a call. It made its way down the Mason-Dixon line, deep into the American South, where it found hundreds of un or underemployed nurses. Black nurses, because the same country that drew lines around water fountains and bus stations drew them around hospitals. Black nurses could only work in Black hospitals. There were 200 Black hospitals versus 6,000 white ones. White hospitals prefer to remain understaffed. And so they they looked at their lives and, you know, the nurses that I, I feature in the book, you know, Edna, who starts the story, she says, I can stay in the Jim Crow South or I could wager my life on the whims of this disease and go up north. And so up north they went and they ended up at Seaview. At the time, it was woefully understaffed, underfunded. It was way, way up in Staten Island. Staten Island, the only way you could get to it was by a ferry. And even today, I was there yesterday for an event. It took me three hours to come from Queens to go to Staten Island. It's a train to a ferry. And then now you could take a taxi, but then they took a bus. It's 400 feet above sea level. Staten Island was agrarian. It was basically a farmland. And there was this hospital up on this isolated hilltop with forest around it. And across was the farm colony where they sent prisoners to, and that's the farm colony actually supplied the food and, and everything to, hot, to Seaview. So it was this self-sustaining city basically. And the nurses were sent there and told work. 
And, and, and that's what they were facing. And the amazing part is the, you know, the, 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 the sense of obligation and the sacrifice that was done by each, you know, you know, every, you know, we're all appreciate, obviously, the patients and what they were going through, but all of us, you know, most of us on this, this webinar right now are healthcare providers, and we all had that same feeling in our bodies that said we had to do something. And I think that's what you do so well in the book, is bring out all of the inner desires that make you a healthcare profession. And, you mm -hmm. know, all of us as a healthcare profession, I think we try to rise above and become human, identify with people on a humanistic basis. Yeah. But it was amazing to go back in the 1950s and, and before, obviously, where we could allow, you know, discrimination to interfere with people's lives and, and that desire. Um, uh, your description, in it, uh, it, your descriptions over and over, like, especially for like what Edna had to do to come up to New York and what she gave up are, are impressive. Yeah. And I think that's an important thing that I try and emphasize when we think about people leaving a place to go to a better place, right? And so the, you know, the initial reaction is like, oh, well, she was leaving the South and she was coming to this kind of promised land. And the mythology surrounding the promised land was that New York City was rife with Jim Crowism. The Harlem Renaissance, Langston Hughes said, and I'm paraphrasing now, that the average black man did not pay his rent from the Harlem Renaissance. That was for white entertainment. The Savoy hired black people to entertain white people. Black people could not go to the Savoy and enjoy the entertainment. And so these nurses, despite having, you know, these black codes that dictated their lives, also had their community, their families, their homes, their churches. You know, Edna was leaving behind everything she had ever known at 28 years old and coming alone up north. She had been watching and raising her younger sister who was five. Um, and she had made a promise to her parents who had left in 1925 and she was left there alone. She had been clerking, you know, sorting and stapling papers because she couldn't find a job as a nurse. And so when this opportunity came to her, the choice was renounce, you know, everything she knew in Savannah, leave her younger sister with a brother in Washington, D.C., and come to New York City alone. We need to remember also the South was warm. The landscape was different. They come up to Harlem. You know, she's jostled and bustled and people are pushing her in all sorts of ways that irritate her because she's not used to it. And it's an invasion on her space. The concrete landscape was also jarring the cold just start from there you know a lot of these nurses could not get used to the cold um and then there's this public transportation system and and so i want you know when we think about people leaving even today the choice is never difficult it's almost an impossible decision to make and they come here and where are they coming to they were tricked into thinking sea view was in new york city they didn't know, you know, we, they didn't have Google Maps. Where they could say, oh my goodness, this place is across the river, right? Um, they didn't know what they were going to encounter. And I talk about this on the book in a chapter called Contagion on the Island. When she arrives on Staten Island, it had been notoriously racist. Um, they had burnt down a quarantine station just 70 years earlier because it was a station where boats coming into the harbor were stopped and they would put patients with yellow fever or malaria. And, and the, the city had burnt it, uh, the people of Staten Island had burnt it down um, with the blessing of a judge. And so th now the black nurses staffing Seaview was a double problem. Number one, they were black. So the story, a nurse had told a story of when she would get on the 111 bus, people would move away from her. She said, they, they looked at me like I, quote, had the plague, like the germs, quote, were going to jump off of me onto them. And so then they had the other layer of the disease itself being this ostracizing disease because what, and, and we talked about this earlier, you know, it's tuberculosis is a social disease, right? It's a disease right. that is linked That's to poverty. True. The people at Seaview were all immigrants. They came here looking for a better life they found slums, sickness, and Seaview. And so 
the microbe had the stigma of, of being, I don't want to catch tuberculosis, but then the city layered on top of it, the xenophobic idea that it was coming from the immigrants or the migrants, the black people coming up from the South. And so it became racialized in the same way that we did. We, you know, people racialized AIDS. It was a gay disease. They tried to do it with COVID. It was a Chinese disease. And so there was all these layers that these nurses were navigating, you know, and they themselves were considered second-class citizens. I, 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 I totally agree with you. And, and, you know, it's always amazing to me, TB has so much to, to teach, you know, and mm -hmm. the parallels, I mean, nothing has changed. Exactly. I was struck that in the, you know, you describe in the book that there is, you know, a terrible nursing shortage. They don't have enough people are dying. Right. They're shutting down wards. And yet there are people in the community, very, very prominent people yeah. who are making up stuff saying why you couldn't have an African-American, you know, nurse, you know, they were saying, you know, they weren't smart enough, you know, or, oh, yeah. they would, or, or that they would, what do you call it, that they would chase away everybody, or they would steal and, I mean, unbelievable stories, and, and yet these nurses overcame all that and ignored them, and did it, I mean, there's a, a, a touching, touching scene in the book where one of the patients, you know, literally spits on the nurse. And yeah, that is, is go ahead, please. So please. yeah, there's that that story was so oh. confounding to me. So in World War II, the only place that black nurses could serve were in the POW camps, which were housed by predominantly German POWs, and there were hundreds of them scattered across the country. One of the hospitals that was a few miles from Seaview, Halloran Hospital, had been a hospital where they were putting prisoners of war and soldiers coming back. If they had TB, they sent them to Seaview. And so this Nazi POW ends up on the floor of one of the nurses' wards, and he hates her from the outset. And the poignant thing about this story is that the Nazi is one of the most reviled people in America, right? That you couldn't have found a more reviled person, and yet, he finds one person in America, this black nurse who is beneath him. And for eight months, she puts up with this man, basically in his dying state, torturing her. And at one point he he turns and he spits on her and he tells her, I hope you die. Um, and so it was so harrowing to me that in all of this, like her supervisor, nobody tried to remove him and protect her. And yet she went to work every single day and did her job. And then, and and I want to say something to you as healthcare workers, as all of us on as healthcare workers on this webinar, each one of us has gone through maybe not like that, but a very similar story where somebody who either you don't like or they don't like you, but you have to rise above. You have to be professional because your calling is no matter what take care of that person. And that really hit home with me. I, 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 every so often yesterday, I was involved in an episode with, 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 with something that happened to one of our workers and they were treated in a way that should never happen to anyone, especially someone who's trying to help you and our hearts go out. And I, Maria, you brought it home. It just, it just was all there. And I want to thank, thank you. you for that. I also want to, you know, kind of touch a little bit about the, other stories that are going on at the same time. I loved your story about here they are in the sanitarium. There's really no treatments whatsoever, right? Yeah. And the story of the brown bomber, you know, <laughs> versus natural. I thought that you brought it, the the vividness. I mean, hey, look, I'm a sports fan. You know what I'm saying? But I could I could see the scene in my head, and these were people who were sick. They were, the world was falling upon them, but yet they all could come together no matter what yes. over an event, please. And I, I, that was really important to me because the nurses love baseball, Missouri love boxing. Um, and that was a very big cultural moment. And one of the things I did with the book, I wanted the cultural moments, the things that we say punctuate right. these eras to really be the backdrop of the book. And I looked at it as a stage where you kept switching, you know, you switch out the scenes. And the Joe Lewis fight against Max Schmeling was huge. You know, the burden on Joe Lewis 
to raise America, this democratic nation against this fascist country was huge, right? And so everybody was invested in this, regardless of whether you like black people or not. You were invested in this because Joe Lewis was not representing the black race. He was representing America. And of course, America was better and he loses the first round, right? And it's at Yankee Stadium. And I'll be honest with you, I cannot watch boxing. There's something about yeah. someone pummeling someone, you know, to death. And I, I just put on, there's tons of videos. I put on YouTube and yeah. I watched the videos and I listened to the recording and I read all these sports writers. And I was like, this is kind of fascinating, right? And so the guys on the ward, I knew this because I had talked to a male nurse who worked under Missouri and said to me, the men's ward was, he said, you know, he was a real kind of New Yorker. And he said to me, you know, have you ever been in an Irish bar at St. Patrick's Day? And I was like, no, I try and avoid that. But anyway, and he said to me, think of this, you know, after people have about an hour of drinks, you know, they get bawdy, they loosen up, they start talking, you know, things come out of their mouths that they don't really mean. And then if you put a sports thing on, that was the men's ward. And so this gave me a picture of what these men what Missouri was living through every day. And he said, there were these groups, you know, you had the groups who looked at the stock market and he said, and it didn't matter because it didn't affect their lives. Right. right. And then you had the group who would gamble. They would play, you know, they would roll dice. Um, and then you had the group who was the sports fanatics and they'd read the papers and listen to the thing. And so that scene with Joe Lewis, when that fight happened, that was real. The nurses brought in their radios. They were in everybody, the second fight, you know, and then he wins. And it's this moment where you think, you think once again, America, because for him, he said, I had the entire black race on my back when I walked into Yankee Stadium again that summer night. And it didn't happen. They continued to like, he thought it was all these junctures where they were like, people are going to look at black America differently. And that's what was the importance of having that fight there, you know, like, and it also was a theme I thought that was very, very interesting, where there's all of this hope. Everything hinges on this that's one it. thing, and you think you're above it, and it then does it. And that's the story of the cure for tuberculosis, I was say, right? That's the parallel with right. the ups and downs, you know, the, right. when Coke Please. discovers that microbe, and, and all of a sudden, there's this, you know, race everyone goes to their labs and they're trying to find things and they're trying to get rid of all of the gold compounds and these wacky quack cures and there's you know chemists are wiping their shelves clean of like all of the things that were used and 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 then this it starts to become pessimism because they realize like oh my god this microbe it's arrogant it's wily it's stealth it's wrapped like this and the more they start to understand how the bacteria itself you know, and I say it's a beautifully rendered bacteria. It is designed to torture and kill slowly. And they can't. They so, wait, 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 Maria, you said it differently when we were speaking before. And I just want to go because I don't like what you said, Cliff. Go ahead, but tell them how you described it before. It's, this arrogant. Go ahead. Go ahead. It was arrogant. It was wily. It was stealth. It was la it was wrapped in three layers of fat. I, I, I think she, and when she's saying this, because I'm taking notes trying to get ready, she's saying this. I think she's talking about me. Oh no. no I, think, <laughs> I think we got a lot in common. I'm sorry, but go ahead. You're right no, about it. Yeah, and so they discover that you know, what, what is going to penetrate this? What is going to work? What is going to stick? And then sulfa comes along, right? And this miracle thing that, you know, Domac discovers in Prontosil and people manipulate it. And they're hoping that it's going to work against tuberculosis, right? And so it, it that too doesn't work. It fails. You know, they try all these different. And so you have these highs and lows of this race for a cure, that seems so far away and so elusive. And that's what was happening culturally in black America. You know, you had these moments where you thought, oh, Joe Lewis is gonna bring us here or the Harlem Renaissance is gonna do that or this or the desegregation of this or LaGuardia. You know, people don't know the hospitals in New York City were segregated, right. not in the same way they were in the South. It's what we call today systemic racism or institutional racism. You know, one family said to me, Missouri in the South knew where to go. She, there were the signs told her, but she came here and she thought she could go somewhere and she didn't. And so only four of the 29 municipal hospitals allowed black nurses to work. 
Um, and so when the nurses desegregate the hospitals, they're like, oh, we're moving towards a moment where we're going to be accepted. Wrong. Oh, when, you know, the the um, when the U.S., you know, the military says you can serve. Oh, this is going to be it's wrong. You know, and every single major cultural shift, they're slapped in the face in the same way. The cure is pushed back again and again and again. You know, it's these highs and lows. And I think the beauty of the story is that everyone had their eye on the long game, even though there were moments when it, people were crestfallen and said, we are never going to find a cure for this. It's this never going to happen. You know, I think when streptomycin failed, and I'm I'm going to paraphrase it, but, but I have the quote in the book, one doctor said um, he felt like it was the end, like there was nothing left to try anymore. And yet they tried, you know, and you had... They but, you know, that's when Isoniazid came along, right? And so these moments of people having their eye on the long game, the patients to look and say, we can keep going, um, was extraordinary to me. I, I was blown away again and again. You know, we saw it a little bit with COVID, where, but it was different because we were working in real time in a democratic way, information sharing that was happening back then, but not at the speed at what at which it's ha it happens today, or it can happen. Right, but but you know what's interesting, but at the same kind of personalities behind it. I mean, one of the things about COVID was the personalities. Right. And I got to say, one of the things about uh, about TV was the personalities. They were. And the, you know, and if you look at the personalities, like, you know, Waxman and, and yeah. you know, Ab Albert Schatz, and then obviously going to people like... Uh, you know, uh, like uh, Dr. You know, Dr. Hinshaw, who took, a, you, you know, it, it really, TB was the fortune, because at that point, remember, there's only like two or three antibiotics out there. This is a right. brand new thing in the infrastructure and the, that had to be built on these people's shoulders, please. And, and I was going to say, one of the things that was extraordinary, but not surprising, every single person had a personal vested interest. Correct. You know, Schatz, saw he said when he was growing up in Connecticut he came from a very poor family he saw his friends and and his community dying of tuberculosis waxman's sister died um of diphtheria and he became um determined to you know dig in the soil and then eventually he came to wanting to find an antibiotic but um edna all of these people were affected by tuberculosis you know, little known story, and then you'll read it in the book. So Dr. Robichek's son is still alive, wonderful, wonderful human being. He shared with me his father's papers. Um, the papers are these stapled together piles like this of the drug trial, which has all of the names of the original isoniazid, the 97 people, and then he added, I think it went up to 220 before those uh, files stop. Um, and so, Dr. Robichek's father died of tuberculosis. He had laryngeal tuberculosis. He suffered for six years and he had gone to Saranac Lake and then he came back and the disease came back in his lungs and they offered him the opportunity to go back to Saranac Lake and he decided he wanted to die at home. Robichek came from a relatively wealthy family and what he's, when his dad died at 16, his son told me my father Dr. Robichek, um, his life kind of collapsed. And his father died on in May of 1929, just a little while before the nurses started quitting, right? So you have this serendipitous moment in time. And I say, like, the stars had aligned for these lives to come together in this what would become a galvanizing moment in global history. And he tumbles into this morning and decides somewhere inside of him that he's not going to go into the family business. He's going to study medicine. And he goes and he studies medicine. And he believed he went to work at Seaview for free. He was never paid. He was the acting medical director. He um, believed that nobody should capitalize off disease, especially tuberculosis. Um, he was livid at what happened when the story leaked. His son told me that he called it Black Thursday and he was hiding in his office because he was like, I don't have the data. It's not a cure, right. you know? And and his, invested, his vested interest in finding the cure for tuberculosis or at least a remedy 
ran really, it was in the fabric of who he was. And he started out in pathology because he believed the only way to understand a disease is to understand it from the inside and then out. So he wanted to look at how it ravaged the lungs, how it ravaged the bones. And then he moved to the, out, the external part, which was, let's see how it affects you socially. Um, and that it is a disease not of poverty, you know, only people that are poor. It is a disease of people who are poor who don't have the means to open a window, to eat correctly, who don't even speak a language, you know, that to understand what they need to do, who are afraid um, to, to be ostracized from a community. So everybody had this like deeply invested interest. A lot of the nurses had, Clemmy's father died of tuberculosis. Um, when she was two, one of the nurses. Um, so they knew what the disease did and they all were invested in wanting to make the world a better place and, and, and yeah. eradicate this, this scourge of humanity. And, and, you know, exactly. And, and, you know, for me, it's a constant story and we'll talk about this, you know, in a second, but it's a constant story of, you know, of, you know, you know, thinking that only, you know, if, if black nurses could work in regular nurses, everything would be okay. It's a story about if we find the cure, it, 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 you know, just like COVID, if we had a vaccine, right, right, it would be gone, right? And I got the real feeling not only about, you know, because, you know, luckily now, I mean, black nurses can work anywhere, which is good, but that doesn't mean that they don't face a lot of the same challenges. But right. I really felt the challenges to me of women too. Like it hit me when Edna, who was so meticulous as a girl, wanted to be a surgeon. Yeah. She wanted to be a surgeon, but she couldn't. There was no chance she was being a surgeon. She had three strikes against her. And right. I, there's that amazing scene where she's assisting the surgeon in doing a thoracotomy. And I have to say to anybody who wants to know what a thoracotomy must have been in that operating room, read it because Maria, I don't know how you did it, but I got to tell you. I'll tell you. I watched, I have a friend who's just as a little bit like off as I am. And one Saturday night I said to her, hey, I found this YouTube video from 1925 of somebody doing a thoracoplasty. It's two parts, it's 34 minutes. So she said, I'm gonna get a glass of wine. And we sat. <laughs> and you are a TV nerd. <laughs> Welcome to the TV. I took, I took <laughs> notes and then I was like, how long was that incision? And I read that it went from like 12 to 18 inches, yeah. how it went around the back of the, you know, the shoulder blade and how it came around the front. I looked at the way it could, you know, disfigure the body. Um, but Robichek had written this beautiful three-page thing called Impressions of Seaview. And in it, he wrote, it was just his impressions. He said, I can't describe it anywhere else but sensory, right? And he wrote this beautiful passage of like being in the operating room and seeing, that's that where that quote came, um, ribs being sawed off in quote, bushels of six to eight <clears throat> time, you know? And I was like, what? That is where, you know, the operations turn to butchery. And I, I keep saying it is a, it is incredible that the human race has survived based on what we've done, you know. But you know, what else, what else, this is just, what else did people have? They were hanging on to everything. Exactly. But I have to say in that scene, what I have to tell you really got me was when the surgeon was Sit, sewing yeah. up and she said he did a sloppy job. Right. And, and so she and could that, do yes. nothing about that. She couldn't so, say nothing. She couldn't yeah. do nothing. He wanted to. You could see he just wanted to go and and, and change it. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> so that yeah, the nurses, as we know, are the ones who they watch this and they can't say anything, right? right. They and you see those images, the doctors here and the nurses at the bottom of the bed, right? And that is the hierarchy. And so she's in this operating room and she knows that first of all, this person probably is going to die because she shouldn't be undergoing this surgery, but surgery had become this kind of gold standard at the time. And so they were just cutting into people, trying to help them. And the surgeon starts stitching and Edna's mother was a laundress and she was a meticulous sewer, um, seamstress. 
And she watches him do these stitches where the scars, you know, they had, the nurses talked about the way the scars were these huge gaping like lines. They looked like almost little snakes. And she's horrified because she's, it, she says, you know, she thinks like if I was a surgeon, if I ever had that opportunity, I would have sewn better. And she never had that opportunity to be a surgeon. And that's really what she wanted to be because as her family said, quote, black women in Savannah, you know, really left menial jobs, let alone become surgeons. Um, and so she becomes a surgical nurse though. And that's the brilliance of it. And I have to say, look, there's, we have a long way to go. But, you know, but the, the, the advancements that were made, you know, and the causes that were made, right. it really is so well pointed out. I mean, one of the things also is, you know, Edna's daughter, who I really thought, like, one of the things that happens, and you see it in the book, and you see it in all of our lives, there is that influence to be part of the medical community. Yeah, the intergenerational and, nursing. Right, yes. and, and, you know, Edna's daughter, you know, who she hadn't seen, she gave, she gave, not oh, her, her daughter, sister. I'm sorry, Edna's yeah, her sister. sister. Sorry, she gave up her sister when she was young because so she could become a nurse. And then she finally buys a house for herself, which was a great story too. And she brings her back and she shares her dream and of becoming a nurse too, which she does. I mean, and it's just that it, it, it's like we always talk about, it, it's planting the seeds to the future. Yes, you know. and that's what they did. And I hope that, you know, I know people want to get to questions. Yeah, right, right. right. But I just want to say like, one of the things I hope people do take away from the story is the triumphant part of it. That's the right. part that, um, you know, tells us there's always people willing to take care of us. I'm talking to probably, I see 233 of you. Thank you for taking care of me and for doing this. And that the people on the front lines are often the ones that stand in the back and never, ever get really acknowledged. And, you know, I say that is the essence of the book. It is triumphant. What they did was extraordinary under impossible circumstances. And when I interviewed families, I spent years interviewing this because there were no archives for the nurses. They said to me time and again, they just went to work. They just went to work. They just did their job, you know, and just now they're starting to realize after the book's been out for six months, they didn't just do their job. They did something extraordinary, but often when people do extraordinary things, they're not thinking they're doing it when it's happening. So yeah, if you could just like, you know, read the story and then think of the, that, that triumphant moment. Um, yeah. You know, the way I looked at it is, is truly standing on shoulders, standing on the people before us every day. We're all grateful mm -hmm. to these heroes. I mean, and, the, I guess my only thing that the way I, I felt ending the book, you know, at the end of the book, which again, I, I highly recommend is we're not there. You know what, it, it was that feeling that I had with COVID and that I had with TB. Everybody thought if we just had a cure, yeah. if we just had a vaccine, it would all be over. Right. And it's not. And it it's proves not. the last part, which is that TB is not a medical disease. TB is a social disease. A social disease. And unless we all band together, you know, and once and for all commit to eradicating this disease, it will continue and it will always find a way back. Right. It finds its way back through social crises. And I really think that is the message. It's a message of hope. It's a, a message and encouragement we can do this, but it's a reminder that we've been here before. Right we got to keep fighting until it's exactly. gone. I think, you know, I could go on forever. I Me mean, too. I, I, mean, <laughs> I, do leave, I know, I don't know if people, there's a, there is a question. Yeah, in the back. Yeah. I don't, yeah, it's, it's, um, well, let you know, and just for everybody on, you can either put it in the chat or if you guys want to, uh, I think Stephanie, we can unmute people, right. And we can have them ask the question live if I'm correct. Right. I think so. Theoretically. All right, let's check. So, uh, so, <laughs> so, yeah, so if somebody wants to unmute themselves, uh, please go ahead and ask. Don't, don't worry about it. But uh, a couple, of, you know, I, I saw like a question before about the the work. You know, what was the work schedule of the nurses? Somebody was asking how many hours did they work? How many? How long were their shifts? Um, you know, and what was amazing to me something. Uh, that I had the same issue, you know, as being the medical director of the last TV sanitarium left in the U.S., you know, um, many of the the nurses lived on the quarters, so they didn't they did. ever get, and, it, you know, Staten Island was so remote, 
that it was their whole life. But what was their life? You know, what, how many hours did they work and how many shifts, you know? So they were working anywhere from 12 to 14 hour days. And the ones that lived there sometimes would just do overnight books. I mean, overnight, uh, sorry, books. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, right. And it, it, it it shaped their lives. I mean, they they were completely invested in this disease. It, it's, you know, like when you live on a college campus, it's a little different than when you commute. You're It's always there. You're always the one, oh, can you cover this ship? Because they just had to walk, you know, two minutes to get to their home rather than commute. But even when they were commuting, a lot of times they ended up staying at the hospital because they'd missed the last boat. But, yeah. they, they missed the last bus to Very, the boat. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, yeah. And so... Um, yeah, that, that was, um, that there's a whole bunch of questions. I think yeah. that's why I got distracted. It was coming no, up. No, 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 no. It's okay. I got you. But so, so Maria, how long did it take you to write the book? Eight years. Eight years. And, and how did you do that? Like, uh, did you do, you know, you're a mom, right? So this is, Cause this is the story of women, in my opinion, you know, of, you know, how, how did you do that? Um. <laughs> How did I do that? Before the pandemic, my daughter was in school. I started when she was four and then the pandemic happened and she was nine. And I stopped, I actually stopped writing. I rewrote it three times. And the third time that I rewrote it, it happened when I, you know, I experienced COVID in, in New York. I was a mile from ground zero Elmhurst hospital. I was out one day, it was maybe three or four months into it. And we would see the morgue trucks. They became a kind of regular part of our landscape. And we went to, we walked and I saw Elmhurst Hospital. I, you know, the nurses were working with garbage bags because they didn't have protective equipment. And I saw the line snaking around. That's a very heavy immigrant area. And I thought, this is a book about who lives and who dies. And so then I started to rewrite it. So it was very hard. I was, I really didn't, it was hard to write when my daughter wasn't in school. She didn't go to school for a year and a half because her school didn't open. Mm. So I was just writing at night. It was in fits and starts. And then finally, when she went back to school in 2021, um, I was able to sit down and write it again. So it, it was hard. And, you know, it's always hard to write when you have a kid. And I just want yeah. to make it, you know, <laughs> mothers out there, we do extraordinary things. So... Uh, and, um, and and yeah. and thank you and thank you to your daughter I, and your kids. I mean, they gave up on, they gave up their mom. And, and we know it that is. kids... Kids don't want to know what you're doing. Kids just want their mom, you know. So uh... she, she had fun. I would take her when before COVID. I would take her to Sea View, and she got to see the ruins, and she helped me do some research. <laughs> oh, Maria, you know? Maria, Maria, that's not fun. I mean, you know, you're you are a TV nerd. It's like when I made the excuse that I take my family on vacation and we go up to Saranac Lake to see Little Red. That's not a vacation. <laughs> well, for her, it was. Um, so somebody wanted yeah. to know. Um, I was going to say, they want to know about the nurses being infected. Right. And you have a really, really great little chapter here. Uh, you you write about it on, uh, about it. Do you want to take over? Because it's devastating the effects that it, it had on nurses, please. So we don't know how many ended up with tuberculosis because the hospital didn't keep their records. They didn't care. Um, there were nurses that, all of them were infected. They mm -hmm. all tested positive. But none of the families that I interviewed, their their family members did not die of tuberculosis. They died from cancer, heart disease, and they lived very late into their like 80s or 90s. Um, there were some nurses that did die from tuberculosis. We just don't know how many of them, the percentage of them, because there are no statistics on that at Seaview Hospital in particular. Right, and I have from uh, you know from the passage you have here, it says uh, just like you said. By 1935, most of the nurses that tested positive for TB, over 2% had active TB. That, you know, that's a lot. And unfortunately, like she said, uh, many had died. You know, we just don't know. Yeah. And while they're asking that, you know, here's one of the outrageous parts, math. That, that hit me hard, right? Can you talk a little about the nurses not being allowed to wear masks? And the and the kind of parallels to COVID because as I was reading that I was like oh my goodness the, the so nurses please. had um, their supervisor was a woman named Miss Mitchell this Teutonic white woman who was the daughter of a Confederate medic Miss Mitchell was hired to retain and retrain the the the, the ranks of nurses at Seaview 
She had come from Willard Parker Hospital, which was one of the premier infectious disease hospitals in the country. And she, when people started to talk, it was this guy named Arthur J. Myers who started to talk about the importance of masking and how it might prevent nurses from catching tuberculosis. And she refused. And she said, my training techniques did not you know, have masks folded into them. So no, they're not doing it. But what Miss Mitchell used to do to, to torture the nurses was she would lurk in the hallway and try and catch them doing something wrong. And she said, well, anytime a nurse puts on a mask, I see what they do. They ball it up, they put it in their apron, they, they are complacent and they have to be vigilant against the microbe. And if you put a mask on, they're not gonna be vigilant. So she did not let them wear masks. Now, the interesting thing is when I first read this in 2015, when I started researching the book, 2016, <laughs> I was like, this is kind of dumb. Like, why would I I'll just put a line in there? And, and who would fight about wearing a mask? Like you go to a hospital and they have a mask on. You, I had my daughter and they were wearing masks in surgery, right? And then COVID happened and we saw these basically wars. We saw nurses getting punched. A nurse recently just told me a story that she was working on the pediatric ward. Um, a dad came in to see his kid and he put the mask on in, in, the, in the room. But when he was walking in the hallways, he had it off and she had approached him and said, can you please put the mask on? We have a lot of sick children here. And he became so indignant, he started yelling. And she said, please, you know, there's a lot of immunocompromise. He said, I'm doing it in the in the room with whatever her name was, Rosie. She had to call security. He was, he was going to get physical with her. He was like in her face, on top of her. And it was like, literally, just please put it on. You are on a pediatric ward. Um, and we have a lot of a vulnerable population. And so... Um, yeah, that I was stunned. And that's what I'm talking about, about literature and history. We will keep being on this mouse wheel until we say this was actually happening way back then. The difference was, I think, with tuberculosis versus what's happening now is people really wanted the disease to be eradicated. So even the anti-science people, anti-mask people were like, all right, if you want me to put a mask on and this is going to go away, please make it go away. Now we've just divided into two camps and we're ready to go at each other at any turn, but that was shocking to me. And, and then I just amped it up and, and made it a theme in the book, right. you know, because she also didn't want them doing other things. Um, and, you know, yeah. I, I have to say that like as a physician who's literally taking care of thousands, I really do mean it, thousands of TB patients at this point in my 30 years, and having the opportunity to, to speak with many of them, I've never met one TB patient who said they wanted to spread it to anybody else. As a matter of fact, yeah. that becomes the biggest motivator for most. I'm like, you, you know, you didn't want to get this disease. Nobody wants to. And right. you definitely don't want to spread it to others. You know, and I think that was a major theme back then. Like, you know, that, you know, that TB was a stigma. And, you know, you were a victim of this disease, but you would right. you also have the responsibility not to spread it to others, you know. Right, and that, was, that right. was those posters where right. they, the posters about tuberculosis were these moral imperatives, like, you know, your kiss, there's one of a baby with these rosy cheeks, and it says, your kiss of affection is my kiss of infection, right? right. And right. so these moral imperatives of do not kiss the baby, or do not spit, and they have like this finger pointing at this little tiny man who's spitting, you know, as if God is going to smite him. You know, it looks like, you know, the, you know, the, right. the thing in, uh, oh, God, with the, the, oh, the Michelangelo, the, the yes. touch. Where, yeah. And the, the finger is pointing down, right. and his rays coming right. out like God. Right. Adam, was, right. mm -hmm. You know, you were sinning. And, and there were these moral imperatives to keep the population safe. But also, it was a scarlet letter. You did not want to be infected with tuberculosis. And so you tried not to make people sick. There was also a different way of thinking morally about your other your, your people, name. I mean, and again, not for, but remember, you know, because you could say things are different, you know, there's more of a distrust in the government. But remember, this was all happening during the Depression. And if there was ever a time when nobody trusted the government, uh, you know, that that was, exactly. uh, it was interesting to me about that. So, you know, I, I have to say somebody, Mary, uh, Mary Evage had made a really interesting point. She said, and again, I, I, I think you're touching a nerve and your book touches a nerve among healthcare workers especially on nurses. I mean, and again, if I haven't said this enough, thank you, thank you. We do thank not, you. Yeah, we do not, I can't thank you enough, and I can't thank our nurses enough. 
every day. They are the true heroes. And she was just going over what she had to do to become a nurse. She worked as a nurse's aide. She worked as an LPN. She worked for, she became, she got her RN, then she got her BSN, and finally her, her master's in nursing, you know, and I, I have to tell, I have to I'm tell you, right? now, yeah. you know, you know I, I, I have to say to you, this is the dedication, and why do you do all this at the end? So you can educate, so you can right. treat, and you can, you know, teach, and I mean, it, it is, it's a very, very strong, strong tradition. Well, you know what, I, I, I do want to just, uh, I, you know, we have a couple more questions and if anybody wants to call, but I, I have to say something to you. So I have a very unique perspective on this and, and many of the, uh, some of the individuals on this uh, call, uh, this webinar, I think is with me because uh, in Florida, which is very unique, we closed our sanitarium in 2012. And I was, and that was the last TB sanitarium left in the country. And, you know, I really took to your, your, your pictures, and this was one of the pictures of Seaview. And, you know, as, as you can see here, um, they had the solariums at the end. The whole idea of that solarium was to get as much sunlight in. And, and one of the things we didn't talk about is how much they knew. I mean, you know, it's so funny. We all, they, the rest therapy and, you know, trying to be in the sunlight and breathe fresh air it didn't do anything. It did do. And you're right, Maria. You said before that the death rates in New York, just by opening up the sanatorium, cut the death rates in half, you know. Yeah. And that's not only just in, in New York. did that throughout the United States. But I got to show you the next picture, please, Stephanie. This, is AG, this was A.G. Holly Hospital. Uh, next picture, please. Yeah. So this was A.G. Holly. And the interesting part is, next picture, please. Uh, I always like the double bar. You have to love the double bar across the Lorraine, you know, so we always did keep our heritage to tuberculosis. That was the symbol, as you pointed out, of the National Tuberculosis Society, uh, which, you know, had its issues. Interestingly enough, when a cure finally does come, you you have a beautiful part on how it became political. Mm -hmm. But this was this was oscillariums. Uh, and you can see this very, very large campus. Uh, where the patients used to walk around. It was really great. And then the next picture is the picture of, um, is the picture of, uh, I had such a feeling for those solariums. And, you know, you would talk about your kids and, uh, you know, during the, you know, we have a weird thing in Florida called hurricanes. I'm sure, you know, you, you, you know, hurricanes, uh, you know, are, uh, as you know, a very Florida thing. Don't try to take them from us. <laughs> but during the during the hurricanes, I used to have to sleep in the building with my family, and I used to bring my kids there. And you know, most of the AG Holly was abandoned, just like Seaview. And when we slept there, we could actually feel. And I know, don't call me crazy, but you could actually feel the presence of what went on there. You know, both good and bad. And this solarium, I had purposely turned this room into a library meeting place just to remember, you know, and it just always brings it back. And next picture, because this is really what kind of gets me is this, and this is what Seaview looks like now. And this is where these buildings, and, and again, it's not about buildings, it's more about patients, but mm -hmm. these buildings really, really represented, you know, in, in many, for many a, a sense of cure and getting better, but for many it was the end of their lives. And it, it is a, just a, I believe, uh, almost a hallowed ground that's being yes. disrespected, you know. It is. So I want to just uh, kind of summarize. It. I want to kind of end up, but I, I do want to show you this next picture. Next picture, please. And these were the Black Angels, you know. And I, what I love about them, that dignity. Look at the yeah. dignity. It's such, a, it's such an amazing, like, hard, like, we are professionals with our capes. And, you know, I, I just, I love this picture me too it's and so it's so poignant you know but, and they're just so proud and but, and but check out check out the hat so at eg holly we used to have a picture of the capping ceremony mm -hmm. and with the capping ceremony because so many nurses learn to become nurses in places like this and that 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 nursing cap you don't see that no more but that was a sign of pr being proud you know and i have to say this was amazing i mean and then Last picture, and then, uh, you know, but the last picture is this. And this is a picture for all of us in tuberculosis to remind us. This is the famous picture that came initially out of one of the New York papers, but then made it to life uh, 
to Life uh, magazine, this was the patient celebrating their cure on the ward. And, and I remember, just want to, go, go ahead. Please. I was just no, going to no, no, say the go. picture is snapped by the famous photographer Nat Fine, right. who was who became famous for capturing Babe Ruth's bowing at <laughs> baseball. But I had this picture on my wall for eight years because if you notice, the woman who has the pom pom uh, satin jacket on in the front. Right. Behind right. her is a nurse. And then behind the other two women is a nurse. And their expressions are staid and somber and nobody stopped to ask them what was going on. And I just thought of this photograph of these were the women who helped these people, these women come back to life. And it was like a, an awakenings moment when they were taking, you know, when, when they were in this trial, basically all of these women about two months before were on death's door. They were emaciated. The woman in the front picture who has the black shirt on, she was 97 pounds two months earlier. Um, Hilda in the front over there with the pom-poms entered Seaview at two years old. Okay. She spent five straight years at Seaview going in and out between like 18 months a year. And so she too was slotted to die. That was the criteria. Death had to be imminent. And so this photograph is so telling because when it was snapped nobody stopped to ask what was going on with the nurses and they knew a whole different story and so that's why I love this picture because now when we look at this photograph we know that the people in the back were actually the ones in the front that's but right. it's also that celebratory moment of something has come to an end and we're entering a new era with TB and TB drugs well, at least we hoped, right? At least it we is. Hoped. It is a yeah. it is a photograph of hope. It is a photograph yeah. that tells us that you know there are too many untold stories as well. Even the stories of the people in in the photograph. Um, well, I, so I have to I know say, we're out of time. So yeah, I have to say thank you, Maria. I know I've said it only a thousand times, and I still have more thank I got to thank you for. But I uh, I I got to say that last picture, and the reason I wanted to end it with that picture is I'm a pulmonologist. And as a pulmonologist, I became very discouraged. I was discouraged because everybody I took care of, I never could, I couldn't do nothing. I had patients with COPD, there was nothing I could do. Mm -hmm. I had patients with cancer, there was nothing I could do. And then just like in the story, somehow my paths crossed with tuberculosis. And now I was given the tools, thanks to the people and the knowledge that was learned in places like Seaview, to cure these individuals. And I've witnessed people coming back from door, death's door to full mm -hmm. life. And everyone on this webinar has experienced that. And it's a blessing. It's a blessing we've all been given. And thank you for bringing it to life. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone, for taking time in your afternoon to hear the story, to participate. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of the questions. They sort of started to come through a little fast and furious. Um, if you, you know, you can email me and I'm happy to chat with you more. Or, you know, if you have questions, I know there were people, somebody asked a question about babies. If you really want to know, I'm happy to tell you about the maternity ward at Seaview and the babies. So thank you. Have a great afternoon. Um, and yeah. <laughs> Karen, take us away. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And thank you, Dave, for facilitating the discussion. Um, we'll have a brief uh, survey that we would appreciate your feedback on. Be looking for that in your email. And Maria, I look forward to seeing you sometime next yes, month. Thank you. And um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Have a great day. Happy World TV Day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.